This is the CLT, a safe place for you and me. Possibly the best show in the Queen City that's not on TV. I want to welcome in two-time World Cup champ, Olympic gold medalist, you're an ESPN commentator, Julie Fowdy. Julie, thank you so much for joining us on the CLT today. Wait, I didn't hear the music, Tiffany. I know, I'm, cue I'm cueing Come it up. On. You got it, here we go. <laughs> I, you know, took months. I locked myself in a dark room in a studio to really prepare for it. But really, it just took me five minutes and my dog barks on command for treats. So, uh, yeah, well, you, you, if you don't have a dog barking, it's not quarantine, I feel like. <laughs> I, right? How's it going for you? Uh, I, um, I picked this mug because it's not tea, it's coffee. Sorry. Uh, because one, it's your color. Kind of, right? Like, that's close to Charlotte's colors. You came from Charlotte FC colors. And then it, it reminds me, oh, happy day. Like, fake it till you make it. Let's be happy. Oh, God. Oh, God. I feel like that's what we do every... No, I'm just kidding. Not every... Let's we're pretend happy. we're happy. We're Everything's happy. fine. I let you down. I should have got my mug out. In fact, I've done, like, a bunch of these without even having... Like, I just drink Gee? out of my... I just drink out of my, like, thermos thing. It's, oh, come on. You need to have some tea. Look, you got your gear and this, you got, you got your package. I've got my shirt on. I mean, we look good. Right? <laughs> I love I, the colors. I love I, the crown. Blue looks good on you. The crown looks good on you. Charlotte FC Queens. Is that what you guys are going to be? That's, you know, we might as well just change it. Right? <laughs> I feel like I you've, got enough, you've got enough clout to do that. So you just make the call. Maybe, or maybe we just need to bring you a women's team. Hey! 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 Congratulations, by the way, in Angel City. Thank you. Thank you. How exciting is that? Especially, I mean, to have played and now to be on the, the other side, like, involved in helping to build this team. What has it been like? It's been so fun. And that group of women and men, I shouldn't exclude the men, but I mean, what obviously resonated with all of us is you have all these awesome women from different industries who essentially were like, yes, let's go, let's do this. We can do this together. We can bring these different silos together, these creative minds together. Um, and it's been super fun, super fun to do it as a group of players as well. I mean, that was one of the things that I think day is near and dear to me is we were surrounded by all these awesome women all the time and we got to do things collectively and when we made decisions we often made them as a collective group and so the first thing of course that came to mind was with with Mia and myself uh was well this really feels like we should be doing this with everyone from Southern California like this shouldn't, shouldn't just be to us two and let's let's get the band back together and get you know, different generations and anyone with a connection to Southern Cal, either they lived here, they played here, they, um, they grew up here. And so that's, that's been really fun to bring all that group together again as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm so glad you brought up the women part of it. Like majority female owned is, you know, this team is, which is so important. First of its kind, right? And so, uh, in talking with Ryan Khalil, former Panthers center, who mm -hmm. I know you guys are obviously familiar yep. with, um, he's part of this team too. Right. He told me how important it was with his two daughters uh, to be a part of something like this. What kind of message now are you all sending, you know, out, out to the world, to the country? You just don't see sadly in the sports world, many female majority owned majority run, uh, professional teams, of course, right, a across the board. And so I think that was hugely important to us as part of the player group that um, – and one of the things that, you know, always resonated with us while we were playing, of course, is that, yes, it's important to win and stand on top of podiums and we're competitive and we want all of that. But there's always been a bigger cause, bigger mission, right, whether it's inspiring young girls, inspiring young boys, but showing what's possible – 
And this very much aligns with that type of thinking, Angel City, the ownership group, right? They want to think differently. They want to, as they call it, you know, set the playbook for what's possible with other sporting franchises and other leagues even. So, and it's interesting because you already are getting a lot of inquiries. Today, I got a text from a friend from Northern California who said, hey, two very high net worth women are very interested in something similar. And who can I connect them to? And it was like, boom, that's our hope, right? Is that this is a tipping point and hopefully a roadmap for others to say, we could do this. We could bring a really unique set of people together to come support women's sports in a in a meaningful, positive way. You love to see it and you hope it gets the ball rolling. So you guys have a new team. We have a new team and- Very you know, exciting. That Charlotte FC name last week. Um, just to see the expansion of the MLS, how great is that for, for this sport? Well, I, can, I mean, I think back to, to the early days of MLS and also having lived through two failed leagues on the women's side, and, you know, there were so many people who from the beginning of MLS to our two failed leagues with this third league who were like, yeah, soccer, right? Soccer is not growing. Uh, you keep saying you're at this critical tipping point. You know, you've been saying that for 30 years, but it feels differently. And I'm sure Tiffany, you feel it as well. Like there's a, there's a growth and a movement and an excitement around the game both men's and women's, that's so fun to see and to watch and to be a part of. And so when I see Charlotte as the 30th team to join MLS and you see the success and the growth of those teams from some of the founding teams to the newer teams, it's really encouraging because as a sport, I mean, we, we obviously want to see that growth and that success and to get to a point where we can say, yeah, we do have enough momentum to sustain this for the long term, especially on the women's side, which has always been a challenge. Uh, we do have enough high net worth individuals that are willing to invest. We do have women that are in the game. So all those things I look at, and I think it points that to the fact that soccer is, is rapidly accelerated and growing in this country. And you've been to Charlotte, you've been to the Carolinas before, right? I'm certain of it. Yes. Oh, oh yeah, lots, lots. Hey, like half, a, like, no, actually not even, not half, three quarters of the national team is from there oh, practically, just, right? Yeah. <laughs> On the women's side. I do want to talk about that too, because you mentioned before getting the band back together. Uh, but, but real quick though, just to have, I've, I've always equated the Carolinas with being a soccer area, a soccer place and so for for this area to now have a team like it's it's just such a cool experience and so you've obviously gotten to experience some of the fans around this area what have they what have they been like to you like to oh you? it's fantastic all of north carolina charlotte i mean you go into cary of course which has a long history you know north carolina university of north carolina also obviously with anson is where so many of my teammates and national team legends have uh, been uh, to school. But the interesting thing is they all come back too, right? Everyone loves North Carolina. You have so many that are living out there. We were just talking about that the other day. I mean, Mia all the time, you know, I think secretly she wishes she could be, you know, in, in North Carolina all the time. And she's, she resides in Los Angeles. But um, it's a... It's a, a fantastic base. Sorry, I'm starting to sweat with my scarf on. I have to, I have, I should switch over to my shirt, <laughs> Tiffany. Look at me. Well, no. it like, it's almost like I wanted to wear my scarf, but I'm in Carolina and I'm already sweating here. Because <laughs> I don't have that good Cali. You do. I, could, I could pull the brandy and take my shirt off, switch it out. Um, so the... Not, but not just the enthusiasm, there's a loyalty there as well. Like you feel it in various areas, right? You see, you go to some, some states and there's great enthusiasm, but there's not like a following following to their core. And the thing I sense with Charlotte is it's deep. It's deep rooted, it's loyal, it's passionate. And so I was ecstatic when I, when I saw the news, of course, that the Charlotte adding an MLS team and you guys getting that 30th 
that 30th team. So I think it's, I think it's a wonderful fan base. So I'm going to go back because the show is just all over the place because that's just what we do here. Yeah, um, that's, how, and, that's how it's supposed to be. <laughs> so when you mentioned getting the band back together, I, I mean, how much fun is it when you get to connect and spend time with some of your former teammates? I mean, obviously I was a huge fan coming up. So how special is that for you? Oh, it's, it's the best because these women, I mean, I say it all the time to, to them. I say, you're stuck with me forever. Our kids are going to be, you know, best friends as well. Like, I am in your life whether you want it or not. And, and that's honestly such a gift with sports that I tell my kids all the time. I have a 13-year-old daughter and 11-year-old boy. And I say, you know what? The greatest gift for me has been I've been blessed with these teammates, whether it's you know, my Mission Viejo Soccerettes Go Green Machine that I grew up playing with for 10 years, or my college team at Stanford, or my national team. I mean, these are sets of friends that are like sisters to this day, that I'm super close with all three sets of them. And, and so that's, I, I mean, it's it, to be able, and with the Angel City, to be able to do it with a group like that, that represents so much good in terms of not just being great athletes, but more importantly, great humans. And that's what I've always valued, right? I wanna be around people that are gonna say, that dream's not crazy, go get it. And that's the kind of women they are. They're not only badasses, <laughs> but they're wonderful human beings. And, um, and I can call them friends for the rest of my life. So that's what is really a gift. Teammates, uh, yeah, are truly a gift. Do you have maybe an idea of you know, who was the, the quirkiest, who was the funniest? Is that here? Swaggy. What kind Swaggy of dog doesn't bark through a Zoom call. It ain't a Zoom call. <laughs> what kind of dog do you have? I have a golden doodle. I have one of those designer mutts. <laughs> I just got a mutt, but I may get him a designer uh, sidekick maybe. We'll, we'll yeah. see uh, a partner in crime. <laughs> they're so cute. They're, they're, they're fun. She's very sweet. If she comes up here, I'll put her on camera. My I God. think I might have locked the door. Get out, Swaggy. Uh, sorry, God. what was your question, Tiffany? How did I got distracted. You're going to start looking at my dog. He's sleeping on the couch. You can't see him. He's Come sleeping. on. Let me see your dog. <laughs> my place clean. I, I rushed to, like, move boxes and stuff because I was notorious for having crap by my front door uh, during <laughs> these interviews. <laughs> I'm a professional. They get, they, there he oh, is. Oh, don't you love that they always want to be close? Oh, look <laughs> at you. What's your name? Roman. Roman. I don't with his little head on the side. Oh, he's made Hi, Roman. Of the C on the CLT. <laughs> I don't even know what I was asking you anymore. Oh yeah, your teammates. <laughs> so, yes. What about him? Who was like your funniest teammate? I mean, we all kind of have an idea of who we saw cutting up, but is there anyone? Uh, yeah. Anyone oh God. Yeah. Okay. How many days do we have? So you've got varying uh, degrees of, of funniness in terms of type of funniness. The driest, most witty on the team is Mia, okay. which um, people don't see, you know? They're like, what? I'm like, oh my God, she can do every impersonation. She's hysterical. And it's always kind of like understated under her breath to the side. These are impersonations um, of like so, celebrities? Or are these impersonations of yeah, teammates? Yeah, Scottish <laughs> accents, different accents, different people. She's, she's very funny. Very funny. Um, so I would say Mia and then Carla Overbeck is um, like kind of like sharp witted, like she'll slice you up <laughs> if you're not paying attention. You're like, ow, oh, damn, Carla, you didn't have to come in like that. Like in a good way, she's hysterical. She'll just like, you know, chew you up and spit you out if you don't, if you're not paying attention. Like my, my kind of person. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like, you know, salt of the earth, like no BS to Carla. Um, let's see who else. Brandy is kind of like you can, uh, Brandy, you can banter with, like if you've ever heard a podcast I've done with her, I mean, we're just kind of ripping each other the entire time, which is so fun. Brandy's always the butt of the joke because there's so much, like she's so easy. It's such low hanging fruit. She does so many stupid things that you're like, how, how can we, you post naked for a magazine and you think we're not going to make fun of you? Like, come on, you can't do that. You can't be on the cover naked and think that we're not going to, you know, create a 15 minute video to make fun of you, which we did. 
Um, <laughs> so it, we, we just had a bunch of characters. I mean, that's the thing that people say when they see video or they watch the 99ers or whatever. They say, God, you guys had even current players will say that. Like Crystal Dunn, when I first met Dunner, she said, who I love and adore, she said, oh, my God. I go, what? She goes, you guys had so much fun. And I said, I know. And it should be like that. So you're in charge of fun. Done. I always tell her that. Fun. Fun done. You're in charge of, you're in charge of, you know, bringing the fun and the joy because that really is the secret ingredient to it all. So um, that, that, that's what I too miss is, is there was constant laughter with that group. I mean, they were, they were characters. There's one story, Tiffany, I could go on for days. Okay. But... The floor is yours. No one wants to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> There's one story that like perfectly encapsulates this group. We were in San Diego training at the Olympic Training Sister Center in uh, Chula Vista. So this had to have been like 2000. And I had just bought a condo downtown in San Diego because I was playing professionally in San Diego. So I invited Brandy and Mia and was, oh, the national team was all together. Lil, Nomar happened to be in town, Garcia Parra. There was a group of us that I had no furniture, nothing, but they wanted to see the condo. So we go to check out the condo. And since I have no furniture, we're like, well, let's go to a bar because it's right next to the gas lamp area, right? Which is the gas lamp district, which is where all the bars are in San Diego. So we find this little bar, like a block off the gas lamp, main drag, and no one is in it. And this band is playing on the stage and the band is really good, but no one is in this bar. Bar. So we're not only going to park ourselves in this bar, we're going to fill up the bar for this band. Because when we come in, the band was like, oh, thank you. Thank you for coming in. We're like, no problem. We'll have the place full in 10 minutes. So literally, Brandy and I start like just rallying people in. The, the guy who owned the place is a Boston Red Sox fan. He recognizes Nomar in the group. So we're getting free drinks the whole time for bringing the party in. Literally in 10 minutes, we had it like rocking, standing room only. They're all thumping to the band. By the end of the night, we're on stage with the band, singing the national anthem. I mean, that was that group. It was just craziness. They were so fun. To this day, we're like, thank God there was no social media back when we played. Because that <laughs> been You got to be careful, right? So yeah, you are lucky because uh, you guys got I, to keep it up. Nowadays, I'm like, oh. <laughs> Literally, I was like, there was we were singing the national anthem, and I was like, "You in the back!" Mia always does this. You in the back? Why aren't you standing? It's the national anthem. Get up! And they're like, "Okay, okay." <laughs> oh, good time. Wait, but you, you talked about your um your podcast too. So, and then getting to connect with some of these current players that you have. I know recently you had Megan Rapino on. Yeah, you were celebrating because you guys are your schedules that finally kind of lined up for you to be right. able to get her. What was one of your favorite moments from that interview? Oh, God, Megan. The thing about Megan that I love is the way her brain works, right? Like I had never heard the story firsthand from Megan about the Trump tweets during the middle of the World Cup. <laughs> and you know, as I'm covering the World Cup and those tweets are coming in from Trump, you know, all the media is freaking yeah. out. And yet, you know, and so they're all coming to me as the, you know, soccer player slash, you know, former national team. I remember this because I was, I was watching. So <laughs> Yeah. And, and all the media, like behind the scenes are like, what the hell? What is she going to do? What's going to happen? I was like, Megan, knowing Megan, Pino, she's going to laugh you know, shrug her shoulders and be like, yeah, let's show them. Okay, we'll, we'll then, you know, not just talk the talk, we'll walk the walk. And, but I hadn't heard it firsthand from her. And that was exactly what she said. She was like, yeah, you know, like, great. Shine that spotlight br brighter because I love that. You know, I think she actually said, I just do really well when the spotlight is, is the brightest. Um, and that's what I love about her. Like she has this incredible capacity to um to frame a moment and like the press conference before the the final she sat there it was like a master class 30 minutes you know any person getting into journalism should watch this because she just spun things they were talking about you know 
the, the pay gap with the FIFA money and all of this money, all of the FIFA officials are all there, like the top brass, right? And she just proceeds to slice them up with a smile on her face. They're smiling, they're buying in. She's making the point why it's unacceptable for this pay gap that it's growing rather than reducing. Um, so she, she has, I, I hope, I mean, I tried to get her to say that on the podcast that maybe she'd go into politics. Because she does have, although maybe she'd be wasted in politics, because right now it's, bleh. but, you know, she has this ability to, with a smile on her face, say the hard things and get people behind her. And I know there are people that, there are detractors, but I, I've always said, like, in life, you're going to have detractors. If you don't, you're not doing something right, right? You're not standing for something important if there's people who don't disagree with you. You can't always have 100% of the population on your side. So, I love that she's courageous enough to say things and has the ability to still make you smile while she's she's slicing you up. I don't mean to sound like cheesy with it, but isn't have, having that quality makes you a winner. Yeah. Well, and I had a, 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 a mentor back in the day, Donna Lopiano, who used to run the Women's Sports Foundation, who's just a wise soul. And I was struggling being the minority voice on a Title IX panel I was sitting with. And she said to me something so wise. She said, Jules, if you're saying something that everyone, and they, everyone agrees with it, then you're really not saying anything. Like life is about taking a stand occasionally, right? You're going to have to come down on a side, on a position, and not everyone's going to agree with that, right? And you got to be okay with that or else you're standing for nothing. And I was like, oh, boom. So she's, and she is uh, courageous before it's, cool to be courageous in so many ways, right? She was kneeling before anyone had the courage to kneel. Um, she was talk talking about things, we had the courage to talk about it. And for that, I always, you know, commend her. Yeah, her support of Kaepernick and being able to go out there and, and do that. I'll never forget that moment watching her uh, take that stand. Um, certainly on, on your own soccer journey, and as we've seen, you know, as I've watched you, um, you face a lot of adversity on the field. Uh, we, as you look back at at where you began and how things started for you what were some of the crucial moments that helped to shape you into the player that you became and and shape you into the person that you are now i think you know the, the things that shaped me personally less as a player but more as a person are all the things i had to fight and battle through when we were playing with the national team with a lot of the you know back for us it was more about equitable pay rather than equal pay um but from you know from the early stages of the national team, the early 90s to mid 90s, when we started to realize like, God, this sucks. We're getting $10 a day and that's it. And I can't make a living and I can't, you know, I've just graduated from college. I can't exist on a $10 a day per diem. That only happens when I'm with the national team and yet they want me around all the time. And, um, and so I think that fight of, you know, with U.S. soccer, you know, it's a well-documented uh, battles we had with them back in the day to say this needs to change we need to be marketing the team more we need to be investing in the team more we need to be supporting the women's side more I mean those were hard, hard conversations and really tense conversations and negotiations that I learned a ton about because we we ended up um having to you know threaten to boycott olympics threaten to boycott you know world cups having to unify not just the team around you who's fearful of losing the opportunity to go to an Olympics, but also who wants to play, right? They also don't want to lose their position. So not just them, but then gathering the youth national teams around us. We had a point where Billie Jean King, who was a mentor and friend said, you need the young kids now. You, none of you can go in. And so we called the 16s, the under 17s, the under 18s. We called all their parents. We got a conference call. We got them all on the same page. I mean, that type of learning real life experience on how to collectively get people on the same page, how to get them to buy into what you're selling, right? Which is, this is going to be better for you, actually. We're creating a better next generation. We're creating a contract that helps the next generation and leaves the game in a better place. I mean, those are all skill sets I use every day in what I do, right? And what you're going to need in life, which is trying to collaborate, which is why I immediately went to, hey, we should be doing this with the team. Why is it just you and me, Mia? Like, this should be, this should be something we do together. We have more fun when we're with everyone anyways. She's like, yeah, let's go. Do you still play? Do you still play pickup? 
from time to time? Oh, God, Tiff, you know, during quarantine. I, I got to ask everybody this. I mean, uh, I not now, but pre-quarantine, were, were you like doing pickup games? And because I, I know I played in like a, it was a media game back when I lived in Houston. It was a Dynamo media game. And I, you know, I went hard in the paint, as they say. I played <laughs> a little bit too rough for a media game. I think I took out a guy with a knee brace. Oh, that's not, so good. I'm proud of it. I got the MVP trophy. <laughs> But I'm trying to get at that, yeah. you know, you're still competitive, right? So do yeah. you still do pickup? Do you, do you have yeah. to like pile it back? <laughs> How does it you work? Know, um, I actually, I, I, I don't play much because I'm too competitive and now I'm too old to be able to, to play at the, at the level I would think I should be playing at. So I, um, um, and especially, you know, pre quarantine, I'm on the road all the time, right? Like there's no structure to my schedule. I was supposed to be gone for the entire summer, three months, uh, covering euros, Olympics, little league world series, all that fun stuff. And so I hadn't been playing, but I started playing in quarantine with the kids, like me and my husband, two V two against them. Literally, it was so pathetic <laughs> that I, I, I would like, you know, in, I mean, this, this two V two field is like, what 20 button right it's not like we're playing on half a field and i would like reach for a ball or try and spin for a ball i'd be like oh i'm cramping i'm cramping oh my god they're like mom seriously you call yourself a professional <laughs> i'm just like olympian with a pooch i've now realized the importance of, of stretching before uh, before uh now, more than ever <laughs> It's really humbling. It really, it's like, oh God. I wasn't even at your level, so but it is humbling, regardless of, of who you are when uh, when you, you know get up there. I digress. Um, I do want to ask you about um just your, your journey on the national team and playing abroad. What was the the support like over there? You know, seeing the country rally around you guys. Um, I mean everybody came together in those moments. It was just so cool to watch. Yeah. I'll tell you, it was so neat having come full circle with 2019 in France, just to bring it to the current, right? Like to see the support in France and hear it, like you could, they, you know, they'd have the American outlaws marching to games through, through these villages and towns. And every French person was like, oh my God, like the Americans are crazy easy about their football. I was like, yes, we are. Hello. And about women's football. And they were blown away because every stadium minus the quarterfinal, right, in Paris against France, which I, I honestly, I thought pregame, we may actually take over this stadium as well. We had so many Americans, but once we got in there, I'll tell you a funny story about that. I clearly realized that, oh God, there's more French in here than Americans. But every other game, it was a home game for the United States. That enthusiasm and support, every friend, soccer playing friend I knew was going over, you know, to watch them over the summer in France. And I got to see all these people, you know, from all over the, the world, really watching them that weren't even soccer fans. So that to me is like a former player who was always fighting for respect. And yes, I swear, like soccer's for real in America. You know, you should come support it. And yes, we're kind of good. And you should really get behind it. I was like, oh, we're there. We're so there. I mean, at the quarterfinal of, in, the, um, in Paris for the, Fran for the French game, uh, we were actually, Joy Fawcett and I, former teammate in 99er, were on the field with FIFA. We were doing like the pregame little rally with the stadium that fifa does and they had a french player and then me and joy and i thought oh i think you know the american crowd is going to be louder so joy gets on first and goes <laughs> and this is like literally like five minutes before kickoff she's like and it's crazy it's it's the loudest atmosphere i've ever heard at a world cup game she says i'm so excited because i know the american American fans in the audience are going to be so loud today, right? And all the French go, <laughs> you couldn't hear one American. I was like, okay, <laughs> maybe we were wrong about that. I, I got to do rapid fire now because I guess Zoom is going to kick us off because this has been okay. so much fun. Um, I, I need to get your take. Uh, the NWSL tournament and then MLS is back. Uh, can you rattle it off real quick? <laughs> yes. <laughs> your take on on the dash winning oh the ta my yeah. take your take sorry i was waiting for rapid fire i was like go <laughs> i guess it wasn't really rapid fire I, you know we're off the rails it's fine 
Um, yeah, the Dash was super surprising. Obviously, they've never even made the playoffs <laughs> ever in a postseason, uh, in a regular season. And, and that's kind of the exciting thing about a cup. I think we've all come to the conclusion a cup would be nice in NWSL and some type of uh, tournament format like that. And, I, I, you know, and it, it wasn't, you heard Rachel Daly maybe say it at the end, this is not a fluke, we deserve this. And I agree. I mean, they, they can conceded I think zero goals in those last three games and they've clearly revamped that back line they brought in Megan Oyster they brought in Katie Knott and they um and they looked good I mean Christy Mewis looked good Shea Groom looked good Rachel Daly up front so I, I think most important the thing that always I'm paying attention to the thing that constantly talked about was our team chemistry totally shifted right we're buying in we're we're proud to play for Houston there's been obviously a change of coaches a like carousel of players coming through there there hasn't been a ton of pride associated with playing with the dash it seems like and that was really interesting and i think encouraging for houston fans to see mm -hmm. mls is back i mean what started similar to uh to to the challenge cup where you had orlando kicked out of the tournament because of positive tests mm -hmm. i i was really worried that oh gosh here we go right when you, you saw the same thing happening with MLS's back. And similar to NWSL Challenge Cup, once they got through those initial positives, right, and got rid of some of the teams that actually tested positive, you went this last whole stretch of, what, five, five last tests. I know they, they list their samples. They update them every day or every few days of, you know, zero positive tests and they've done thousands and thousands of tests. And for them to pull that off with how many teams they have, you know, it's easier. It's an easier task with nine teams with NWSL. What, what's MLS 26 to pull that off in Orlando. They didn't end up with 26 um, has been a great feat. And it's been fun to see teams that, um, you know, similar to Houston that traditionally hadn't been doing well, San Jose rocking it right now, Minnesota making it into the quarterfinals. So I think that's been fun to watch as well in this type of format, which is very different than clearly a full on regular season. The one thing I will say to um, and this is off topic now, but just being able to cover this sport now, everyone's been so welcoming. I know we had a mutual friend, he's your colleague now, Sebastian Salazar, yeah. who connected us. You got any dirt on him for me? Oh any? gosh, how many days do you want with Sebi? <laughs> I mean, there was a point in quarantine where I was like, Sebi, you, you, you need to cut your hair. It, <laughs> did you see it? It was like the pompadour, like straight up. He's like, I got a lot of hair going on. I was like, let me, let me add it. Let's go. Well, just ask him about the number of products he had. We were like best mates <laughs> in Houston, and it was absurd the amount of hair products he had out on his desk. But I, I you know the thing about Sebi that I love to death is Sebi is so he. I mean, talk about buying in on what, women's soccer. Oh yeah. Like he. I mean, soccer in general, of course. I mean, he follows everything, but he is so up to speed on the players and the news and the teams and everything i love it you can just sit there and rattle with him forever about it and he's so engaged he, he he's said really too many, you said too much nice stuff about him so, <laughs> uh, what's who's next on your podcast julie we're actually on break right now we just finished season three so um yeah we'll probably launch season four in like october but the nice thing is is it's such a good diverse list of women you know from not just soccer players but iconic figures in sports from Simone Biles, Billie Jean King, Jackie Joyner, Michaela Schifrin. I mean, it's just awesome women that get to tell their stories. And I've, I mean, Tiffany, you know this format well, when you don't have to, you know, get everything into a three minute soundbite on a, you know, yeah. feature you're doing where you have actually some time to talk is so fun. So I, I came in a little bit dragging my feet to the podcast world. And now I was like, what the heck was I dragging my feet for? This is so much fun. Well, maybe we're still locked down. Let's hope that we're not. But if we are, you got to bring it back early. So give us a Yeah, right. I know. I know. It's fun. Julie Fowdy, everybody. Thank you. This has been so much fun. So thank uh, you so much for coming on the CLT. You're excellent, Tiffany, at what you do. I love to see it. You're very kind. Thank you. <laughs> This is the CLT, a safe place.
place for you and me. Possibly the best show in the Queen City. That's not on TV. Oh.